Mr. Selvan Govanda, uh, the Board of Directors and the Chairperson of uh, PECO, the uh, Organizing Committee of uh, Wazulu Natal, led by Mr. Morgan Tambiran, um, my team from the University of, uh, the University of Technology, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at this conference, uh, the PECO South Africa 2015, Navigating the Future. Ladies and gentlemen, I also want to take this opportunity for the organizers to actually organize this conference in Devon. As you know, Devon is the place. Um, and this reminds me, I mean, some of you probably know Frankie Preverly of Mays when he says, this is the place, this is the place. And so the excitement about Devon is always there, whether it's summer, uh, uh, spring, winter, autumn, doesn't matter. Uh, Devon is always the place to be. Please know, I'm not from Devon, so I'm not praising Devon because I'm from Devon. I'm not from Devon, I'm actually from Newcastle. It's a very cold place somewhere up in the north of KwaZulu Natal. And I live in Pretoria and work in Umlazi. <laughs> so, yeah, it's true. I, 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 I'm, I'm from Newcastle, I live in Pretoria and work in Umlazi in Devon. Uh, so you can imagine the logistics and coordination that are required to be able to actually do um, my work. Actually, I was just talking yesterday with Selvan over dinner that uh, because of the Fees Must Fall campaign, uh, our program had to change in a number of ways. But certain things had to happen. And I had to spend a couple of days away in Camperdown. But I couldn't do anything other than just focus on what I was doing in Camperdown. Taking into account that, of course, I have to wake up here and be here uh, this morning to be able to be with you. Ladies and gentlemen, I also like to acknowledge uh, one of our staff members, Mr. Vitalis Demande, who actually, um, and I think sometime in July or June, July, somewhere there, kept on asking and pestering, you know, you have to come, you have to come and speak at this conference, you know. So um, I, 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 I take this opportunity realizing the importance and value of uh, the PECO community uh, as our community and so on. Ladies and gentlemen, this conference, um, I'm not sure how much time. When I talk, I tend to talk too much. So if you feel like I'm talking too much, please raise your hand. <laughs> I must say that. I must say that up front because um, I can really, really, really. But what I was saying is that this conference is about navigating the future. The future is dependent on two things, the present and the past. Um, as, a, as a history person, I learned that history is a study of the past in order to understand the present and be able to predict the future. There are two components here that we know about. The one is where we are at this point in time and where we come from, but we don't know where we are going. So now and then we have to think using our past experiences to make a determination as to what is likely to happen in the future. And so it becomes important for a conference of this nature to be able to think along those lines. But before we get to that point, I would like to take you back in terms of, you know, the history of our higher education system. And I know um, our history goes back a long way, but actually, it starts somewhere in 1994, in a sense that the new policies, the new thinking about our higher education system. You know, um, um, let alone the events of the, of the past week, I'll, I'll come back to that, but prior to 1994, we probably know that there was a conglomeration of education systems in South Africa with a number of university systems uh, and so on. Um, at Indian, colored, uh, white universities tied to different systems. 
uh, for blacks, you know, homelands, some with uh, independence, some without independence. Um, and, and, and that led to a different type of varieties in terms of historically advantaged institutions and historically disadvantaged institutions. That created challenges in terms of how we see higher education in South Africa uh, and so on. But with 1994, I think all of us agreed that there are issues that need to be addressed within the sector and to what extent we could find ways in which we could work together to be able to do that. So, if you think the, the higher education sector as such, 1994, I think 1995, I call it a, the policy development era. Uh, Professor Pengu, most of you probably know or remember, um, uh, in a sense that that was the beginning of the new development of new policies, uh, new higher education act, and all sorts of things that were to design and shape the future of uh, higher education in South Africa. This was followed by uh, what I call policy implementation. Um, um, my favorite uh, um, minister, I'm sure, uh, Professor Asmal. Uh, Professor Asmal, they used, he, he had a name they used to call him because of his, uh, you know, activism and so on. So, but the interesting thing about him is that he called it restructured higher education, so to say, because that's when you started seeing things like um, um, uh, mergers, um, uh, some institutions um, um, disappearing, and so on. So, so the restructuring of higher education meant that we need to think differently. We need different ways of thinking about what are the kinds of things that we can do better. Uh, new forms of universities, we have now traditional universities, we have uh, comprehensive universities, we have uh, um, what you call now universities of technology. But within that context, there was also the concept of the, high, the National Institute of Higher Education, which has disappeared, but in terms of the new thinking, is back in the fold. Um, the ones that we established were uh, closed in favor of the new universities of Mpumalanga and the um, um, uh, Sol Plaik University in the, in the Northern Cape. Of course, some of these things happened during the era of Pando, Pando's era. Uh, I call it stabilization. If you think about what happened, it was more like, let's do the things that have been agreed to and do nothing else to shake the, the higher education sector. So just, you know, continue with what we were planning, called stabilization. But in 2009, there was a new wave called re restructuring uh, in Zimande, Zimande's era, uh, in a sense that new things happened. One, a new department of higher education was established, which actually uh, indicated the value and importance of higher education in South Africa. The, we saw TVETs, uh, CETAs being brought in within the concept of post-school education. Um, uh, and this concept was actually firmly grounded in the white paper on, um, on uh, post-school um, uh, education. Now, um, Mr. Governor just talked about free education. The next wave, which is 2014, 2019, would be the free education era. And it's started already, in the sense that, if you remember 2007, Polokwane resolutions, one of them was the need to, prov to make way for a, a free bachelor, you know, free bachelor education, meaning any student go to university would study for free. The problem with it is, how free is free? And is it free? You know, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, a bit later. The, the important thing, all these eras I'm referring to, actually, you know, if you read the, the, the post-school white paper in terms of what is its vision, everything remains more or less the same. In that, one, 
a post-school system that can assist in building a fair, equitable, non-racial, non-sexist, and democratic South Africa. That is something that permeates all these eras, the need for that. The extent to which we, have, we are on the way or about to, to achieve that is something to be seen. And it's all of you who has to play a role in making sure that we try and find ways in which we could do that. We need to be building a single coordinated post-school education and training system. How do we do that? Uh, articulation becomes the most important aspect of it. Uh, and the issues around differentiation. How do we, you know, I always find it very interesting that, um, well, let me put it differently. I was sitting at uh, a Moeni guest lodge having dinner and then a student, uh, another colleague some, from somewhere joins in and we started talking. And it so happened that this guy actually studies, studied at uh, MUT. And so we started talking and then all of a sudden he tells me, yeah, you know, we've got this problem when we, when we leave Mangosu too, we go to other universities, we, we find difficulty, we have to start afresh and do certain things in order for us to progress, you know, do masters and so on and so on. And so, and the question is, why can't we articulate appropriately? What is it that is wrong that we're doing for our, uh, making us fail to articulate our students appropriately? But the other thing that, is, that I realized was that actually, we sometimes don't know that, you know, within the context of our work environment, uh, you have your professionals, your specialists, your professionals, your technicians, technologists, and your artisans. And the question is, who trained these people? And how do we make sure that if I decide to be an artisan, and five, ten years down the line, I want to be a, a technician, how do I progress to that and beyond that? and so on. We have created we have, or insulated ourselves as universities that we can only do this because we don't want, if you want to be, you have to do this extra and so on. How do we make it easy for everybody to articulate? This is an issue that actually is a major challenge in the, in the higher education sector. A strong and more cooperative relationship between education and training and the the, the employment sector. These are uh, critical aspects that we need to think about and so on. But in terms of expanding access, the sector has grown. Um, if you think about in 20, uh, 2007, there were about 700,000 students in higher education. In 2015, they're supposed to be around a million or so. And the expectation is that by 2019, there should be at least 1.1 million students in higher education. And how do we do that? Um, we want to increase access, but we have a limitation in terms of the number of institutions and the size of those institutions. We know now that government is trying its best in terms of saying to what extent we could capacitate through infrastructure funding uh, and other means to say that uh, we need to increase the number of students who can be accepted in higher education. But the problem, the funding is an issue. The funding is an issue. Uh, the block grant has grown. Um, if you think about 20, 2004 from 8 billion to 20 billion in 2015. But that's just the block grant. If you think about the total spent by government, it actually grew from 9.8 billion to 30 billion in 2030. 10 billion of which is actually on earmark funding. It's good, but bad. I mean, my team finance spend more time auditing a number of grants, earmark grants, uh, that we're not allowed to actually charge the audit fees uh, back to government, uh, meaning that we have to have additional money to be able to service uh, these grants. These are the issues that you find uh, in higher education being um, of, of, of interest. But of course, the issue of free education, as I said earlier on, um, today, uh, government contribution in terms of real value is less than what it is in 20, 2004. Um, and today, we have absorbed what you call it um, uh, uh, fees must fall. 
higher education, we as in Mangosu too, we have to absorb at least uh, about 40 million. But interestingly enough, we had already calculated that in 2014 alone, we were undercharging our students by 47 million. Meaning, for every student registered in, in, in 2014, we didn't collect, not that we didn't collect, we didn't charge them 4,100 as uh, such. Uh, and by the way, we happen to be the most affordable university in South Africa, you know. But still, uh, there are those issues in terms of how do we make provision for the services that are required by the students if we're not able to collect or charge them appropriately. Now, it means that one way or the other, government is going to have to take uh, the, uh, the, the portion, that portion, on our behalf. Uh, and of course, believe you me, come 2016, the students are going to call for free education, and we will give them. Why? Because we've shown them, if you make noise, we'll give you. you know? So that's the, the challenge. All these problems in higher education, you know, we spend approximately 50, 60 billion in higher education. And all these need to be, we have to procure services, one way or the other. Uh, we have individual uh, procurement offices uh, within universities, and to the extent possible, the changes in the sector, but the changes also in procurement require that a new procurement think uh, we need to, to look at. You know, if you think about the two papers that were produced, I think in 2013, by, uh, one by uh, Deloitte and the other by uh, KPMG, you know, talked about the future of, um, of procurement in a sense that why procurement must transform itself. Um, you know, Deloitte argues that um, we need to, to, well, the paper propagates for a radical rethink about procurement by 2020 in a sense that we must see procurement as an arbiter of risk, reward, and creativity, as a nexus of, uh, at the nexus of finance, operations, and supply chain. We must see the people within uh, procurement uh, with a rich, um, or what you call talent rich. See them as risk forecasters, um, uh, but also see them as idea generators and innovators, not just as people who buy stuff for us, but how they help us uh, play a more strategic role. And I, I do believe that within the context of this conference, uh, the couple of days you hear, you will be able to explore these kinds of things and how best uh, we, could, we, could, we could benefit from. The KP, KPMG study called uh, Future Buy, the future of procurement, looked at you know, uh, procurement people as financial experts, internal consultants, intelligence agents, relationship brokers, risk managers, and more so as legal uh, contracting experts. Uh, but also, you know, some, some of us think that because I want this thing, then I know. You know, we see, must see them as supplier coach. Um, um, how they interact and work with our suppliers to be able to bring the users uh, to benefit from that. And so, how do we do all these, um, these, um, these things? All this requires a different kind of a, a procurement woman or man, uh, as such. So to the extent possible, and I hope that the time you spend here will be of value uh, because, of course, we have the users, which are the universities, and we have the suppliers, and the extent possible, what can we benefit from one another and be able to chart the way. More so, if we think about the cost of higher education, how do we use economies of scale to be able to reduce the cost? You know, and these are the things that we have to, as managers, find ways in which uh, we're able to. And so procurement 
uh, PERCO South Africa would play that role uh, as such. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Inlovu. Uh, we see you're a great supporter of free education and also of the procurement departments within the institutions. So thank you for your support. Obviously, I think also you make a good point about uh, procurement people, uh, the need to find creativity, to bridge the gap between suppliers and end users, and making sure that we are stretching our end as far as possible. But thank you once again. Thank you. Uh, next up is Dr. Martin Mandu, who will be chairing and facilitating the conference for the next three days. Dr. Mandu is director of the Midland Center of the Durban University of Technology based in Peter Maritzburg. He has extensive experience in the fields of higher education with four qualifications, BST, MTH, PhD, and MDD. He previously worked as a priest in the Catholic Church, after which he moved into academia. He previously um, he worked as an academic development tutor at the then University of Natal and lectured in the School of Theology in the same university. He was then appointed as an assistant vice chancellor of student services at the ML Sultan Technicon when he assumed duties as executive director, academic development, training and skills provision at the Durban Institution of Technology. He served as a board member on the South, Afri South African Association for Academic Development and as an editorial board member of the Academic Development Journal. He currently serves as a non-executive director on the board of the Cancer Association of South Africa. Also an accomplished academic and leader who will chair and assist the 2015 PERCO SA conference facilitation over the next three days. Please welcome Dr. Martin Mandy. <laughs> 